Hello and welcome. I'm Alice Grodnick, and this is Moving Up, a podcast about secrets to success, struggles along the way, and life in general. Today on the pod, Mandy Gilbert, the author of a new book called Just Go With It, How to Navigate the Ups and Downs of Entrepreneurship. Mandy and I have a fun and revealing conversation all about the startup journey. So let's just jump right in. Okay, Mandy Gilbert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Alex. Uh, Nice to be speaking with you. You're in Toronto and you are a founder, entrepreneur, got your hands in all sorts of different things. Um, Let's get into your journey. Were you were you born that way or how did you become uh, so entrepreneurial? I might have been born that way. I might have. Um, I had some entrepreneurial experiences when he was quite young. Um, That's for sure. Um, and it was just something always on my mind as a young professional as well. So, um, I'm very fortunate to have been able to make a decision, um, pretty early on to kind of just jump into it. And, um, and it's been a great journey. Uh, okay. I love it. I'd love to hear about that decision. And it sounds like you were working for some company and maybe not so happy and like, all right, maybe I can do something on my own. What is it going to be? How do I do that? So yeah, I'd love to hear about that story. Sure. Um, I actually entered the workforce quite young um, and, and got into business pretty young and had the opportunity to work with some senior people that I just would observe in meetings and, um, and learning a little bit kind of high level business um, conversation strategy and some of the complexities it brought and I was really, I was fascinated. I, I really was. Um, and at the same time, I was interested in brand and graphic design. And there was an opportunity where I was working, um, where at that time I was an administrative assistant. And there was an opportunity to apply for a graphic design role. And so um, I asked my sister to co-sign a, a loan so I can go and develop my graphic design skills at a college here in Toronto part-time. And, um, and when I did that, I was excited. I applied for an internal role and I thought, well, you know what, maybe I'll go and, and meet with a recruiter and see what other opportunities they might have for me. Um, and so I did. And, you know, the next day I was offered a role to become a recruiter for the design sector and advertising sector. And so um, like many people that fall into my profession, you don't go to school for it, you kind of fall into it. And I actually, you know, certainly did fake it till I made it. Um, I said, I I could do sales, no problem. I could probably, um, you know, reach out to some of the leaders I met along the way and maybe they give me an opportunity. Um, And the next, you know, next thing I was asked to present my sales strategy (laughs) in a meeting. Um, and so I just kind of went with it. I had crazy projections and I really didn't even know the offering or how to position it. I mean, I was in my early twenties. Um, and I was working in downtown Toronto at a very established, um, firm that was, uh, quite, uh, successful in North America. And, um, and so I, I just, I worked hard and I was so shy and, and I lacked a lot of confidence that I didn't really want my colleagues to catch on. I didn't quite know what I was doing. So I would lock myself in the storage room and I put cleaned off a little table in there and I had a phone in there and I literally would just pick up the phone and, and, and cold call, you know, until, you know, somebody, (laughs) I don't know if it's because it was an effective call or maybe they, they felt sorry for me, but they gave me an opportunity and that just started propelling my confidence for me to do it more. And then I became a top producer um, and then I was headhunted out to do a startup for a public global organization. So all of a sudden I was a very young leader um, and I had four or five at that time direct reports. Um, and I, I worked so hard, you know, I worked so hard and I was a, probably a pretty poor leader at that time because I lacked self-awareness. Um, and I just, uh, the work ethic, you know, day in, day out. Uh, And then just some things were happening in the company that I just thought, you know, this isn't really aligned with me philosophically. I don't know if I'm a really good fit for this. I've built this company, uh, this division in Canada. I was traveling a ton, um, opening and evaluating other offices throughout North America. But there's just something missing. Like it wasn't the money. 
it, there was just something that was, I was not feeling aligned on um, because I'm a relationship person. And this model was really uh, pump, pump out the volume, you know, Um, and it was a volume game and I didn't really enjoy doing that myself. So how can I ask others on my team to do that? So, um, so that's what really inspired me, motivated me. I thought, Hey, you know what? I'm 27. Um, I probably going to have a family one day. Um, I better get this done. I better do it now. I better do it now while I can. Um, and so I, I, I went and got a line of credit to update my furniture because I was recently married and that's how I started my business. Wow. And Mandy, I mean, I love your fortitude of just like pushing forward, even though this wasn't the right thing or it wasn't the thing that, that you love, but you go into a closet and just call people until you sell them and you make it happen. Uh, I'm sure you had to work like harder than anybody else there um, at that time, but you made it happen. And like, that's the real uh, spirit of entrepreneurship. I think it is. I think you have to have that, that willingness to put yourself out there a bit and the grit to stick it out. Right. Because not everything just falls into your lap as planned. So for me, you know, I had a lot on the line. I had my own apartment, like there was no plan B. Um, I needed to, I needed to figure this out. This needed to be something that I built on. Um, and, um, and there you go. And so you did it. And that's another lesson, you know, kind of having your back against the wall and having no other, no other options. You just, you have to make this work and, you know, humans are, are good in, in those type of instances. Yes, I agree. Okay. So, uh, you're starting, you realize that this isn't the thing for you. Um, and so what do you, what's next for you? So for me, I, I resigned. I think it cost me 300 bucks to incorporate my business. I did. I had a budget to keep me afloat for six weeks. And, you know, this is, this is before co-working spaces. And then it was cool to meet at a coffee shop for a meeting. That was a bit weird when I started that, that hadn't become a cool thing yet. So I needed to be legit. So that's a lot to do with your location. So I rented a tiny little space in a desirable neighborhood um, because I needed to interview candidates. You know, I needed to interview and I needed to be a legitimate business. Um, and so I, I went to work every day. I brought my, my big iMac from home. Um, you know, Excel was my database and I would do sales all day long and interview all like from five to nine every night. Um, and I just continued to do that until I could start scaling the business. Um, I just paid myself enough to barely survive. And I mean, barely, um, I would make excuses like why I couldn't join friends for dinner because, you know, I would just imagine them like, oh, let's, you know, split up the bill. Or if it was somebody's birthday to have to treat, I mean, that was not an option for me. So I had a very, very modest lifestyle. Um, so I literally would ride my bike to work. I like cut every corner for myself personally, so I can keep reinvesting in the business because I wanted to grow it. I wanted to grow a team. I wanted to grow our capabilities. And I actually, I really wanted to be a great employer. That was one, it was a big motivator for me uh, for, for starting my own company. And so in order for me to do that, um, I had to, I had to make a lot happen very quickly and be consistent with that. Wow. Cool story, Mandy. Uh, I mean, I love it. You, you, you've got your back against the wall. You've got it all riding on this, but um, it, had, it had to have been motivating. I mean, because like you're doing what you were put on earth to be doing. Like, is that how it felt? It did. It did feel that way. And I think when you're doing it for somebody else and you don't feel acknowledged or appreciated, um, you know, that's one experience. You could say, oh, I have, you know, perceived job security or I have a benefit package or, um, you know, various HR programs in place. But for me, um, I felt that accountability when I was employed as well. Only this time, I just felt incredibly like, I felt like I was in the driver's seat and I was energized by that responsibility and that pressure um, to build something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, that, that makes sense when you can do it on your own. But then, you know, then you have the other side of the coin of when you start having employees and people depending on you. Now it's like, okay, well, now I'm in the driver's seat, but there's a, there's a lot of pressure here. Yeah. I mean, that's what, um, that's what really inspired me to write the book because um, oftentimes when you read about entrepreneurs, you're only reading like, these were my five strategies. I made it. I have all of these assets, you know, and my book is really honest and, you know, I'm completely vulnerable in it, which is totally scary putting it out there. But I, that's, that was the motivation for it because it is all great when you're in survival mode and you're getting some traction in your business, you're making a little bit of money, you're able to hire people. But the hiring and onboarding people, I mean, I started a business because I was a great recruiter and I had, you know, I was great at developing relationships. All of a sudden people were asking me like, what's the vision for the company? Um, You know, what are our KPIs? Why did you hire this person? They're not a fit, Um, you know? And I had all kinds of challenges that I felt, holy cow, this company has totally outgrown my own capabilities. Um, how do I catch up? Because I kept just reinvesting in the people and I kept reinvesting in the model and opening locations, but wasn't investing in my own development. And that was a critical part because as you grow, your level of complexity grows and it all aspects require some energy and thought and strategy. Um, and that was, that was a big learning lesson for me for sure. Yeah. It sounds like it. So yeah, Mandy, you brought up the book, just go with it, right? So yeah, tell us, tell us about how that fit into the picture. Yeah, well, you know what I've been doing? Um, I, I never really saw myself as a speaker. Like I, when I went to my first conference and a big keynote speaker came out, I wasn't a person who thought, I want to be on that stage one day. Like, ooh, contrary to that, I, I actually don't like being the center of attention. So I kind of fell into public speaking. A friend was, called me and said, oh my God, I'm doing this panel. One of my speakers totally dropped out last minute. Can you come and be a panelist? And I remember I, just to be a panelist, hand sweaty, shaky voice. Um, I really did it for her. I was bagging nerves all day. I couldn't really even focus on any of my, my roles or uh, any of my meetings. So I went to this event and I, I spoke and, you know, I don't, I didn't even really remember what I said. I was so nervous, but then from that, I got, I was asked by um, uh, a consultant who was working with a really big bank in Canada to, um, to go around the country and be a keynote speaker for all of their women entrepreneurs. And I, you know, I thought I'm going to just, I'm going to take it on. It's very uncomfortable but I like the idea of helping. And that's, that's kind of like, that's my speaking style. It's really through sharing because I do think experience sharing is so uh, important. I think that's how we learn. That's how we relate. Um, and so the more speaking I did, the more feedback I received, just like, I've really been feeling like a loser in my business. And I haven't even been sharing that with my partner or my friends, but I'm actually in a tremendous amount of debt or, or I'm being bullied by one of my employees, or I don't know if my business is sustainable anymore. And so the more that I heard, I thought that's a good reason to write a book is if I could take a lot of what my talks are about and put it into a book, then maybe the reach would be more significant and I can help more people out. Because I suffered for a long period of time. I suffered silently with, um, with a number of different challenges that I've had to go through. And so if I can share that and, and people feel related, it's a relatable um, uh, story or circumstances. Um, and if there's anything in there that they could, that worked for me of how I got out of my situations, that they can apply in their businesses or their lives, then that's a huge win for me. And that, so that, that was really the motivation. Um, it was a long project. It all, it's like doing um, a renovation in your home. It takes a lot longer. <laughs> and so, and it's, it's tough to be vulnerable. It's tough, you know, because it's your experiences. And I made some pretty big mistakes 
Um, and, you know, so you, when you're putting it out to the world, you, you're also wondering, oh, am I going to be perceived as being, you know, all of those negative things that pop up? Um, so it was an interesting process to kind of go back through my timeline and pull some stuff out of there for sure. Yeah, Mandy, I mean, I, I love the authentic nature of just trying to help people and share your lessons and hopefully impact as many people as you possibly can. That's fantastic. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, more, uh, more about the, the subject and the, and, the, and the content of the book, you know, how's it? How's it structured? How's it laid out? What do, uh, what do people get when they read it? Well, they get kind of my timeline, you know, from this first kind of days and, and years to scaling it in terms of headcount, um, going through the great recession mm -hmm. and having no idea, no idea what I was walking into and, you know, implications from not responding fast enough to, you know, growing and scaling your, um, your operation into different countries, um, to being a, a parent, um, and running a business. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really a great kind of timeline. And I think when you read the book, some, some readers have written to me and said, I miss you. What, what, where are you, what, what's your journey now? because they kind of grow up with me as you're reading. And I, I think that with the, the experiences and stories shared, there's just some great insights to pull from that. Cool. One, you know what? And one being, mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest takeaway for me when I was going through this exercise is like, never lose yourself. Um, and you didn't go into business to work harder than you've ever worked in your life and earn less than what you earned previously and not have a good quality of life, you know? So that's one thing. And when you really drill down, that's a lot because what you carry, oftentimes entrepreneurs are the first ones to, to cut their pay or to pay them as much as employees. They take on a lot of extra burden and worry um, and you know, they work so hard. They're not able to really pull back the limbs and refresh, um, and get a real, you know, good perspective of where things actually are and where you want to go. So that's one big part. And the other big part is, you know, reinvesting in yourself, you know, like sometimes it's okay to say, I've accumulated some cash. Um, I could hire a salesperson that's going to generate more opportunity for the business. And that's where we tend to always go because we want to scale. We want that top line growth, the things that entrepreneurs are always measured for and obsessed about. Um, and as I kind of matured as an entrepreneur, I mean, A, I had an intervention that I had to hire an executive assistant. I actually was called into a boardroom I wrote about that as well because I was double booking my meetings. I was late. I would forget about things. I was having to pay like two, three times the amount for a flight because I forgot to book my flight or I booked it for the wrong destination. So my team literally called me in for a meeting and they promoted somebody on the team. And she had, we, they came up with her raise. They wrote her job description and she started as an EA that day. Um, and that was one of the best decisions that they made for me, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and uh, so investing in an EA to help you do the things that you're actually really great at and take you, get you out of the weeds. It's a really great investment. And the other investment is investing in your education. And, you know, regardless of where you went to university and what you focus and how smart you are, you've got to invest in your leadership skills if you want to be a successful entrepreneur or leader. And, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're oftentimes walking around with a tremendous amount of, uh, or lack of self-awareness. You know, you're in a power position, you're writing, you're paying people, you're probably not creating the environment or, you know, it's not natural for employees to give you constructive feedback, right? So what happens is we just are walking around and we think we're great leaders and we're, 
we're liked by our, our employees and, you know, they're inspired by us. And they're probably, hopefully they are, but they might not be. And in my case, they weren't. And I had to realize that being liked and being respected were two completely different things. And, um, and so leadership development and investing in yourself, uh, whether it's to, you know, further develop as a leader, whether it's to think about the future of your business, is it sustainable? Can you leverage technology to scale it? and do cool things, um, it's really important just to continue that process because some people don't, (laughs) they just stop. Um, And it's one of those things you never, it's not a destination. You you just got to always be thinking and always be working on on your culture, your future business, your future clients and and all of those things. So, yeah, yeah. I love it. It sounds like it goes into some some of the pieces of entrepreneurship that, you know, our society kind of glosses over. Everything is so glamorized of, oh, you started a business and two guys in a garage and they made millions of dollars. And it's like, yeah, right. but the other side of it is there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into these things. Yeah. Yeah, there certainly is. Cool. Well, Mandy, this was awesome speaking with you. Where can people learn more about you, find the book, all that stuff? Sure. They can find me the book on Amazon. Okay. And, um, if, if anybody wants to reach out for a chat, they can find me on my website, which is Mandy dash Gilbert.com. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for doing this. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Likewise. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for listening today. If you like moving up, the best way you can support us is by telling your friends. Thanks.